Our next topic for discussion today is going to be, uh, as it's called, the two tales of centaurs and RTGs. Uh, those of you who were around at the time will remember the uh, attendant controversy with the idea of flying uh, RTGs on, uh, on uh, rockets from Cape Canaveral. Uh, here to discuss that uh, matter are three members of our uh, panel. First, Mike Haddad, who is a systems engineer, heavily involved in key payloads for the space shuttle era. Uh, he has also written a book with David Shaler entitled Space Lab Payloads, Prepping Experiments for Hardware and Hardware for Flight. Also joining us today is Luis Delgado, mechanical engineer for NASA, having worked both with the shuttle program and with expendable launch vehicles. And uh, finally, uh, our third guest on the panel is Bob Cabana. Uh, he needs no introduction, a former astronaut, uh, mission pilot, mission commander, uh, our center director out of KSC. And Bob, correct me, were you the longest serving CD out there? That's what I was told, 12 and a half years. Yeah, yeah. You beat Kurt Davis. Right I think Kurt there. might have been there longer, but it might not have been a center uh, for part of that time. And uh, more recently, uh, Bob has come home from Washington, D.C. after serving a stint as Associate Administrator for NASA. And now he's going to get to stay home, fly his airplane, and play with his grandkids. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to the panel. My name is Well, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, what we'll do, we're going to start out with Shuttle Centaur, kind of give you a little history of that, and then we'll go into SS-34 and then 41 missions. So I'll start out. So basically, that's, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, uh, the left picture basically is with, a, with the Lizzie spacecraft mounted on top of the shuttle center. Again, this is a booster that was designed to be able to send spacecraft to directly to planets, Jupiter and out of the outer solar system. Um, to the, uh, right there, you got kind of what it looks like when it's, uh, for the orbiter system. You got the center, and then the mechanism that's used to mount it. That's how it's mounted in, in the orbiter, and then of course rotate it up to be deployed once they once they reach orbit. And the lower left is kind of the valves and, and, and tubing configurations. It was very complex. And Lewis, this is probably where you been, you were an expert on kind of what that was. So you just kind of elaborated. I know you can't read that bottom one, but that's a, by design because it is complex, and we don't want to get into what each line is. But kind of the general idea behind all this. Yeah, basically the Centaur with hydrogen and oxygen, the same propellants that the space shuttle uses. So we were going to be filling the sun star at the same time that the external tank was going to get filled. And so it was going to be a pretty uh, challenging uh, operation, mm -hmm. you know. It was a really green job for a young fluids engineer. All these valves were pneumatically actuated, a very complex system, and just learning that just was just super interesting, so. Okay, very good. Thanks, Lou. Okay, what this is just kind of show, there's actually two shuttle centaurs that were designed. Uh, the one on the left was used for a deep space. And the idea behind this was to show the difference between a, the shuttle centaur, which is a large booster with a lot of capability, and then on the right was the initial upper stage IUS, which is one eventually used uh, to, to, to uh, deploy these spacecrafts to deep space or around the sun. Um, and so that was, this is more of a comparison to show you the difference on why um, the missions became what they were after we switched from a shuttle centaur to an IUS. And you can see the different uh, specs there for, the, for the, the two centaurs in the middle and the IUS on the IUS is actually, uh, where shuttle centaur was uh, too liquid, the uh, IUS was two solid rockets used for that. And that was on a number of missions, teacher satellites and the number, the IUS was used for a number of missions. Okay, real quick, we got, um, hopefully everybody can see, can see this. But it actually started in 1975, and Steve Francois, who actually was the branch chief, NASA branch chief, responsible for the shuttle center, he, most of this information is from Steve. Unfortunately, he could not be here today because he had a family matter come up. So most of this is from Steve. In fact, he started working this in 1975. He'd been working since 1975, and eventually, you know, it was up to the 80s. Uh, but just going, kind of looking at the, why it was, they talked about the, the solid concept, um, was lower cost initially, you know, Centaur was imposed as an IUS. Feasibility studies were done at Lewis and by General Dynamics and concluded that the Centaur was feasible, but it increased head risk. 81, they initiated funding, but then canceled it in 81 for the new administration. And then the DOD and the military got involved. And they had, um, you know, kind of studies that completed in 81. Then the program was mandated by Congress that both Calais and Ulysses 
they, which were planetary. Um, actually, Galileo went to Jupiter. Ulysses was a mission to orbit the sun, the polar orbits of the sun, which had never been done before. Um, and so they got basically a program mandate to fly those two flights using the shuttle Centaur because of its capabilities. Um, in 82, it was expanded again using the Air Force program. They had the shorter version that you saw in there. Um, and it was a joint project with Lang, uh, with Lewis, and of course it was funded by both NASA and the military. 84 to 85, they had some DOD missions. Millstar Magellan was out of the program. In fact, there was seven flights planned for Shuttle Centaur. And so they actually started building, and they built, started building seven vehicles uh, for that. Um, let's see here. And then the launch preparations, they were proceeding at the time of Challenger, when we had 51L. The harbor was being processed, both planetary missions, and it had some, still some open issues. But we're fortunate ahead. The idea was we're going to fly Shuttle Centaur on the shuttle, um, even though it had, had a number of issues. And if there's anything else? Yeah, so, so uh, jumping a little bit. First off, the Centaur is an amazing upper stage. It had a great history. It's been used on uh, expendable rockets uh, for a long time, uh, getting our probes where they needed to go. Um, but I will say, being in the astronaut office at that time, I was a, a young astronaut candidate and eventually uh, an astronaut that hadn't flown. If you listen to John Young, uh, who was chief of the astronaut office at the time, he thought this was just the dumbest thing ever to have a liquid <laughs> hydrogen uh, vehicle in the uh, payload bay of the orbiter having to fuel it, uh, you know, on launch and then uh, the abort situation trying to empty it. Uh, there were a number of safety concerns for having LOX hydrogen in, uh -huh. the, uh, in the payload bay. And so when we, uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, after 51L, um, when we lost Challenger, everybody looks to the solid rocket motors. But from a safety point of view, the, the time that we were down those two and a half years before we flew STS-26, uh, um, we had over 100 changes to the orbiter, uh, safety changes. And when they went back and reevaluated during that downtime, the safety of flying uh, a Centaur upper stage in the payload bay, the decision was made that uh, from a safety point of view, we're not going to do this. We'll get a little bit more of that here in a bit. Thanks, Bob. Um, okay, just quick, quick, some of the work that was performed at Kennedy on this was um, the um, the device that actually held it in the shuttle bay was and, and supported was called the Centaur Integrated Support Structure. We'll call the SIS, so it's easy to say. Um, for the flight vehicle, it structurally held the Centaur and made it a spacecraft for the cargo bay, allowed assembly, rotation, <coughs> basically deployment on orbit. Um, one of the things we did at Kennedy, Complex 36, which was the Atlas um, program at the time, uh, we modified Pad A to look exactly like the orbiter. But why did we do this? The idea was to do testing to make sure all these things that they were worried about we can test, like it was in the shuttle, before launch to make sure it's going to work before we ever got to the orbit. So we had um, we basically modified it again: cryogenics, high-pressure gas systems like you see in Complex 39, the line lengths, the environment conditions, ECS ducts, bulkheads. Basically, it was like a duplicate orbiter. Um, again, this is the same time we're still what launching. Atlas is off of Pad B, right? Right. So you know they had Atlas and Dark number two. Yeah. Was that was that four or five? Yeah. Um, 1985, the shuttle center, we'll call it C1, arrived at Cape. Um, it was planned to mate the mate it with the CISS, which then arrived on the 28th. Complexity of this was amplified by they had five computers, and again it's a voting thing. Five computers, three versus okay, if three say yeah, you do that, two say you don't, you do it. And so that's kind of one of the things that they had in there. Um, for controlling things, and of course, the, uh, it, it, it controlled a number of other activities that happened. In October '85, um, there's a lot of delays in that because of hardware problems. Hardware was late. Um, we can see the numerous parts were, were weren't, you know, they weren't being tested in time. Um, the spacecraft we finally were successful, made it on the 16th. And uh, because, again, when you're launching planetaries or with the uh, like Ulysses, because of the planet rotations, there is only a certain time you have to launch this. If you miss that launch window, you've got to wait 13 months because of the way, say, Jupiter and Earth goes around. And, uh, and so because of that, it was really critical that we launch these things on time. 
Um, so what they had to do is they actually said, well, we're going to have both spacecraft possibly down there at the same time. Well, we only have one building. So they actually made a deal with the Air Force to where we can put spacecraft to what was called the SPIF at the time. It was a shuttle processing integration facility. It's a large building on the Cape side. So we had SC-1, 36, and we had SC-2 basically come in with the SPIF. So we're basically processing these two vehicles at the same time. And I said top vehicle and top of centaurs. Um, and so that's basically what those last couple bolts were. Okay, again, it's, we talked about the complex systems. Now, actually, out at 39, we had to modify 39 for these missions. And one of them was this rolling beam that was designed by KSC. Basically, it was this, the LN, LH2 and GH2 from the Freak Strict that basically fed into the mid-body. Okay, the idea was that it launched just before this thing would pull away. Well, of course, how do you do that? Well, it's a large structure, so basically you use gravity as your friend. You put it on a slant, so as soon as it disconnects, gravity basically pulls it away. As long as gravity is around, this thing's pretty much going to work. <laughs> and so that's basically what that, um, and so they validated that, what we call the LETF, which is basically a complex, where all these things we have to do with the pad, we test the LETF first before it goes to the pad, and this is one of them. We validated that, pro that prototype before it went to uh, 39. Um, the MLP was modified. Again, for LO2 and LH2, the skids. Um, this long heat exchange, this is pretty cool, was added to the MLP. They had what's called warm locks. Now, what does that mean? That means basically you warm locks up, but it's about 290 degrees below zero. They wanted to warm it to 287. It's not much, right? but it's a difference. Well, how do you do that? And Steve was telling me it's amazing. You have this long pipe, and that's all the heat exchanger. He says what they did is they added and removed insulation material until they got 287 at the end of that pipe. That's a very simple solution to a complex problem. And so that's, that was one of the things Steve told me. I wish he was here. He could elaborate it more. But that's one of the things that they used. Um, okay, like Louis was saying, you start the ET system, started to flow, and then of course you go into the centaur. Um, a complex test was performed, you know, to make sure all the stuff was going to work. Then we had the orbiter mods. All that stuff you saw, the orbiters had to be modded. The pad had to be modded to supply it, and of course the orbit had to be modded to be able to accomplish Centaur. And is there anything else? Well, the, the requirement was that you had to empty the Centaur in 300 seconds before you could land the shuttle and uh, return to launch site. But, and they proved it. They were able to offload it in time. Um, so we were on our way to, to keep working the issue, so. So as those, those concerns came up, they ran right. tests to verify, hey, this will work, even though it wasn't easy. <laughs> okay? Um, this is just more, more work, again, by January, mid-January. Um, again, we talked about some of the milestones. A tanking wet test was done. Uh, some new development, automatic propellant loading the vehicle was finalized. The first integrated tanking test occurred on the 15th, mm -hmm. followed by the, the test on the 23rd. And of course, we know what happened three days later. Uh, both tanks were completely filled and pressurized, 110. So all those were tested. First tanking test had some issues with sequencing mm -hmm. and the acts, you know, integrated actions as well as need to adjust open and closing various valves. Again, like mm -hmm. what we were just saying, the timing of all that hardware um, to do all that. Yeah, the valves were made by Fairchild, an outfit in California, in LA, and we <laughs> took a trip. I took a trip to uh, Fairchild with Mr. Francois, who was my boss. And it was so, you know, oh, yeah. you know, you're watching these engineers talk about the details of their valves, and we had to have this valve actuated in milliseconds. And some of the valves had operated a little slow, so we were trying to figure out how do you make those valves consistently open and close in the time in, in milliseconds. Mm. So we were really a lot of issues, but we were working all of them at the same time. So, amazing stuff. Yeah, you guys had a good job. Um, and then we had a second tanking test that basically achieved a lot of the objectives. However, there were some, still some items that they had concerns with. We lost Challenger on the 28th, um, and then in February, they could still continue to wait. Basically, it was like, okay, we had Challenger, we're going to proceed ahead as we need to to get Centaur ready, so whenever we start flying, again, with a 13 months gap there, we need to hit that window, but right after we start flying again, we got to be ready to fly. So everything's are kind of proceeding ahead. The uh, spacecraft SC-1R was actually moved to the vertical processing facility. 
kind of the way it works at Kennedy is like we saw before in the earlier demonstration, we had horizontal processing and operations and checkout mode. Basically, that's called like a non hazardous. It doesn't have propellant, solid rocket motors, no radiation, nothing. It's kind of a facility that's used for non hazardous payloads and it's usually in a horizontal environment. The VPF is actually it's the opposite. It was for specifically for hazardous payloads and it was in a vertical orientation. The idea being there was. Um, because of the shuttle being in a vertical orientation and it has this payload, we'd be able to directly to the launch pad from this facility. So basically, the spacecraft one was moved into the VPF, and then the Galileo probe was moved into the VPF, and so of course those two would be made it then in the test cell. I got a picture here coming up, and so you would then do tests, and of course one of them was our TG system test, and hope you know in the hopes that this mission will go forward after Challenger. Mm -hmm. sure All right, real quick. This is this is a picture, basically on the left. This is of the, the Centaur here. This is all the Centaur. This is the CIS. Kind of just to give you some orientation. These devices right here, the what we call trunnions, that's what actually held this whole stack into the into the shuttle. Um, and you can see all it's very complex. This right picture. This is actually in the VPF East cell. Okay. What you notice is where is all this at? All you see is. This is actually figured, the way the VPF worked was it was a representation of the orbiter. So if you were in the orbiter, right now you'd be looking through the bottom of the orbiter, looking through the orbiter into the payload. That's the orientation you're seeing here. So this part of the payload is actually facing the wave stream. It was just the way it worked because what we would do to get this from this facility to the launch pad is we had this large device called a payload canister. This stuff never saw the light of day. It was always extremely controlled environment, humidity, cleanliness. And so this payload canister would come in, grab this hardware, Basically, the doors would close, and we'd vertically send this thing down, this huge canister down the, to the pad, and you do the opposite. You put it in, in the shuttle, in, in the, basically a payload changeout room. You pull that away, then that room would rotate around, and that's how you put it in the shuttle. So basically, it represents what it looked like in the shuttle. And so I wanted to show that as kind of, and then at the top, they actually have a Galileo simulator on this. But this is what the VPF looked like, and some of the work we did on SC-1 um, at that time. Again, this is, you know, December, January, February, a time frame when all this was happening. Okay. All right, why the Centaur and why it was canceled? Okay, again, without getting into too much, is basically a lot more powerful, okay, and they call it gentle. Solid boosters, as you know, with, with the SRPs, <laughs> it's about a vibration. On the launch, it, they vibrate a lot worse. Or, uh, liquid propellants are a lot less, I guess, not as violent, or whatever you call it. Yeah, the, so the solids on the uh, orbiter, it's shaking and vibrating like this, and once you get off the solids, it's like electric drive. It's just <laughs> as smooth as can be on those three main engines. So, so they were worried about this, kind of between the difference between the IUS and the, the Centaur. So um, one thing, too, a couple things about this, the thin skin Centaur was like the old Atlas vehicles. Um, you had to have them pressurized to keep them structurally sound. Eighteen thousandths of an inch. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you had to keep them pressurized. That was one of the things when Louie and I went over there in the evening, first first day we were there, you hear this going into stretch. Yeah. AC sixty six going into stretch. Going to stretch. Or AC sixty six coming out of stretch. Yeah. And so then in the morning <laughs> we hear AC six coming out of stretch. <laughs> well, because you have to have it pressurized or it collapses on itself. They wouldn't have somebody there all night watching this thing make sure that it was pressure. Right? So what they did is they hung it from a crane. So basically now it's hanging from this crane at night, so you have to keep it pressurized. So basically it's hanging on itself and it's going to stay structurally sound. So when we go in the stretch, that was hang it hangs. And they say, okay, now we're hanging, we're safe for the for the night. And in the morning, of course, they pressurize, everything's pressurized, and they release it. They're going to the crane, yeah. And they did it every day. Yeah. yeah. Going in and out of stretch. That was kind of fun. Um, so that was just kind of some of the things about the uh, Centaur was the same way, but they need to be pressurized to kind of stay. Um, and there's a lot of information there. Um, talk about, you know, some of the potentials of the leak in the cargo bay. We talked about the dump, um, failure to dump the O2 or H2 in orbit. I mean, there's a lot of things that the crew had to do if something went wrong. I mean, you're talking about during launch, after launch, if it doesn't get deployed, it has to come home. You know, all those things that had to happen uh, were not happening. Um, one thing, too, was on the, on the Centaur was the LH2 and um, LH, LH2 and LO2 were in one tank. 
It wasn't two separate tanks. It was one tank with a bulkhead in, bulkhead in between. And if you lose pressure and that bulkhead ruptures, what happens? <laughs> o2 and ace would come together. Oh. Goodbye. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> so that is another critical thing that this that this way this is designed is very very dangerous. Um, and again, again, Bob would probably the first the flight crew stress. The first thing was the deployment opportunities would occur a mere seven hours post launch. The three deployment windows were scheduled in. Kind of what you had to do actually on 41. We'll get into kind of something that happened pretty pretty soon after launch. We'll talk about that when we get to 41. Um, one of the meetings at headquarters is in May 22nd, 86. Uh, Rick Hawk argued that the satire <coughs> was an unacceptable degree of risk. The crew came out and basically said that, yeah. Mike, may I add a little personal experience? Sure. From, okay, a lot of people don't know who I am. Um, I was one of the lead assembly engineers for JPL on the Galileo down here when all this was going on. And when, uh, after, after, uh, uh, we lost Challenger. Uh, we did this fit tech check between the Galileo and the um, the Centaur booster and the Centaur and and our techs and the guys talking. You know the programs are pressing on, saying we're going to be ready. JPL's fixing some problems with the spacecraft. Centaur's working on their thing, but our their techs talking to our techs said under the table, we shouldn't be over here wasting time doing this fit check. We know the bolts are going to line up. We know that the fittings, you know, things are adjustable and whatnot. We should be back over working on the rocket, is what they told us. Their techs, the Centaur techs, told the JPL guys. And we kind of think that everybody was playing a poker game, and the shuttle kicked over the table, uh -huh. and nobody had to show their cards. Right. But everybody was relieved. <laughs> it was just the, and the idea of going to work around that thing. You hoping awesome. somebody else has a delay so you can hide behind that. Well, we, we weren't happy about the shuttle, but you know we needed to work on both things. I have a question for Bob. With everything we see on that slide up there, Bob, how would you have felt about flying Centaur? <laughs> so, well, first off, you got to realize I got selected in uh, the 85 class. I'd, I'd been at NASA for six months. I didn't know squat. So, you know, I, I wasn't smart enough to make a decision on my own, and I deferred to John Young, who said, we're not going to do this. <laughs> he was my hero. No, I, I got selected to be an astronaut, and John Young's office is around the corner from mine, you know? And so, I, he obviously knew what he was talking about. <laughs> yep, and then basically his last two bullets, yeah, the... Uh, Centaur, he said that it was supposedly a, 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 you know, too high of a risk. Um, they had independence of study that colluded the proper course was to terminate the shuttle Centaur and then seek alternatives. And then uh, on the 19th, uh, James Fletcher actually came out with um, the official notification that it was over. Mm. Um, now, one thing there is a positive side of this that Steve wanted me to relay was, you know, General Dynamics Theory created, started creating seven of these vehicles. Okay. But what it did is because of the engines and all that, they were able to use those engines, general dynamics, for other programs. So they were able to use those for other programs and they basically got general dynamics involved in some of the commercial aspect. Mm. So from their standpoint, they used the hardware that was already being built just for other wings, not for launch the shuttle. So that was basically the discussion for Shuttle Centaur. Um, I guess we go into the other, go ahead and call it the other. Can USA's I have one more thing? When this happened is when the Air Force realized we cannot rely on the shuttle. Uh, That's when they went out to Boeing and to Lockheed Martin and I said, okay, I want that Atlas V, that Delta IV. That's how they came up to be because of the shuttle Centaur. You know, they realized we can't rely on it. So. Yeah, a few more, yeah, a few more yeah. slides on Yeah, those are the backup ones we don't need to show. Okay. Wait, so, Mikey? Yeah. Can you hear the comment or the panel on, so how did they refly those payloads? Well, that's what we'll get into now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> zero three second. Yeah, so, so the Ulysses and Galileo, that's just 34 and 41. Uh, we'll talk now about how we, we the captains of the shuttle Centaur. Well, we still got these planetaries out there, well, one going in Jupiter and the other going basically to over the sun. Well, how
how do we launch those? And that's what we're going to talk about. Very good. Yeah. Thanks, Scotty. Thank you for leaving. <laughs> yes, sir. I would like, I work with Steve Francois. I was the second stage lead. Okay. Dang Johnson, people. Yeah. <laughs> and I was. You can. Yeah. And they tested the, uh, in the bulkhead that, I think it was a 1307 bulkhead. 1307, they yeah. They simulated in the tower. They only got 27 ppm of hydrogen leaking on that rocket tank. Mm -hmm. And the shuttle worked with their has gas. I forget the numbers, but in the aft section, when the pumping was up to pressure, it was in the thousands, but it was less than the explosive limit of hydrogen <laughs> in the air. And um, I was up at the Spiff checking out SC2 okay. when Challenger launched. Okay. And we were outside and weren't supposed to be, and we saw the pieces of the Challenger raining down on mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And they they saw we were outside and they told us to take cover. But everybody's, oh my God, it was, mm -hmm. you know, I was, they closed off that area later on. You weren't, mm -hmm. when they launched shuttles. But uh, anyway, as you mentioned already, because of the read look back at the, hydrogen in the tank and getting all the stuff safe if there was a failure or something you needed. You know, that was probably the correct decision. But what you didn't mention, you, ISP, Centaur is a high energy upper stage of over 600. Yeah. A solid motor is in the 200 range. Yeah, right. They had to take about a third of the payloads off of those other missions that were launched later mm -hmm. to lighten them because the rocket motor, the solid, did not have the oomph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, and there's special anyway. orbital stuff we had to do to make that fly. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, um, yeah the, the way the give you an idea with the SPIF we talked about, you have 39A and B is kind of north of the SPIF, and the SPIF is more east and south. So yeah, if you have debris, you guys be pretty close to anything that maybe would come down from 39. Yeah. So I can further add, I lived at Complex 41 for one year when I first moved to Florida in 61. They condemned the thing to build Myla and Dinosaur, <laughs> and they said we were in the third uh, South Padre Island, Kings Bay, and the North Cape was in the running for those programs. It turned out to be Apollo. So I lived there one year and had to move. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, welcome. So I Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Excellent. Awesome. Good job. Mikey, yes, does Centaur ever fly? On other unmanned missions or used on any other thing? Centaur upper stage is an awesome upper stage. That's what I said at the beginning. Yeah. It, it flies, it's flown our payloads everywhere. Oh, okay. Yeah. Both NASA and, uh, and DOD on expendable rockets. So it, it wasn't the end of Centaur, it was just the end of Centaur on shuttle. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because the difference between a, a you know, human spacecraft and non human. Absolutely. I can add uh, Lockheed Martin is still using Centaur yeah. on Atlas V. Yeah. And in the new rocket Vulcan, they have a they have a big centaur, the, the diameter of the Vulcan. So the centaur is still alive, and it's very much uh, a great, uh, probably the best upper stage that we've built in, in history. So, yeah. okay, all right. So we'll go on the 34 and 40 SCS 34 Galileo and Ulysses SCS 41, Mr. Cabana's mission. So we'll start talking about each of those. Thank you, Scotty. Um, okay, this is configuration. We'll start with Galileo, STS-34. It's a spacecraft on the left. The most absolutely beautiful spacecraft I've ever worked in my life. I'll say that hands down. It was just absolutely gorgeous spacecraft. And again, this is in the VPF prepping for uh, basically installation onto the IUS. Again, you look at the IUS. It was smaller, so we're going to have different configurations of VPF to be able to handle that. And then the, all, all the different things on the, on the right was basically the components of the... Uh, of the Galileo spacecraft. Again, the two main things were the RTGs and then the antenna, which as most people realized, um, didn't unfurl all the way. The high gain antenna, when it wanted to deploy, it didn't deploy all the way. So um, we ended up having to do a lot of work through the uh, low gain antenna. But that just gives you a general idea of all the science and stuff that was on the spacecraft. Okay? All right. Now this is it was interesting because there's a lot of things like Astro that happened on the ground before uh, it kind of never flew. Um, it was launched in 89, but that was after 12 years of development. It was on the ground for 12 years before it finally flew. Um, 
Again, a spacecraft was originally scheduled for launch in 82, but a serious delay with the shuttle program, and the Galileo pushed that back. And again, of course, when we had shuttle, that pushed it even farther out, so he can spend more time on the ground. Um, of course, these delays then required the spacecraft and that and other things to be transferred back and forth between Kennedy and JPL a number of times. They really think that that's what contributed to the failure of the antenna. Um, the antenna didn't deploy due to the excess friction moving parts because they think that the lubricant on those basically came off during a lot of those trips. Normally you wouldn't be doing that. You'd, launch, you'd send it in, you'd put it in the shuttle, and you'd launch it. All these trips back and forth were than expected. And I think that was basically the, uh, the reason why it, it didn't deploy in orbit. They, they eventually figured out that the three of the legs of the antenna was what stuck, and that was enough to keep the thing from deploying fully. Um, and then final operations then began in 89 for uh, we get that to launch. Okay, for uh, the shuttle side, 34 modifications had to be implemented after the S-30 on the vehicle to be able to handle the Galileo. Uh, one of the significant mods was the cooling system. With the RTGs required cooling, uh, alcohol mix used, I think it was ethyl glycol, gly a uh, special cooling system for the case temperature of the RTGs. They want to maintain that temperature at a certain level. Um, and these, of course, these are mounted under the orbiter were then fed from ground systems to be able to keep that cool while it was on the ground. That was one of the things that I worked on was the cooling. Um, aspect of that was how do we keep these things cool. I've worked on the, the um, cooling and then we'll get into some of the other things later. Another modification called the flutter buffet, which maybe uh, Bob <laughs> understands what that is. Special instrumentation on a vertical tail and the right left over by elbow. Remember what that one is? Yeah, I just said it was designed basically accelerometers added to the vertical tail been designed to measure in-flight loads in the orbiter, I guess because of the, the weight of the spacecraft or something. But, uh, and the last was the only vehicle to be equipped with this instrumentation. Improved controllers for the water, spray boilers, auxiliary power units, and other improvements for the structure. So again, you had stuff that had to be modified on the ground as well as on the vehicle to be able to support the Galileo uh, mission. It's a very unique spacecraft. Okay. Um, some of the handling operations we did. Um, Probe arrived at Safe 2, which is another one of those buildings in the south end, which is a hazardous facility. Um, and then um, and basically it went from there, and um, got the probe, I'm sorry, the probe, and then the rest of the spacecraft arrived on May 16th. While in Safe 2, those two were made together. If you remember, Galileo had the orbiter, but then it also had the probe that went into the atmosphere. So those two pieces were made together in Safe. Then Galileo was delivered to the VPF, like we saw in the previous <coughs> photographs. And then made it to the IUS. Again, this is a lot of dates on things that happened um, to get it ready. Atlantis was transferred from the OPF to the VAB on the 21st, then made it, and of course, uh, shuttle interface test conducted the VAB to make sure, hey, everything works on the shuttle side. Um, Galley and IUS were transferred the VPF to the launch pad on, on the 25th. Okay. Then the shuttle went on the 29th. So basically, Galileo arrived before the orbiter. And a lot of times we did that because of if there's anything that needed to be done on a spacecraft, we wanted it to be done before the orbiter got there. Okay, if there's something that failed, you had something a really bad day happened, we'll take out the spacecraft, but we want to take out the whole orbiter too. So a lot of times any critical stuff would happen early before the shuttle got out there. Um, of course, then once two were there, the payload was installed on the 30th. We did an interface test to make sure, hey, everything between the spacecraft and the shuttle were good to go. And then we did the TCD, which is basically the dress rehearsal um, on the 15th. Okay, so this is just, again, some of the stuff that was happening with Galileo, okay? Uh, the cooling, again, I won't go into too much detail, but basically the cooling was, again, to, to make sure the RTGs wouldn't get too hot. Um, while working that, of course, you have different things that happened. One of the things was when we went to, um, what you do is you sample, you, you flow this system through on all the ground support equipment before ever connecting the flight hardware. You do not want to contaminate the flight hardware. If you contaminate the flight hardware, you might have to bury the spacecraft in the sand. And so what we do is you just put a jumper in there right at the spacecraft interface and then flow this cooling and do tests, sampling to make sure hey, this stuff is pristine. It beats the spec that we require for the spacecraft. Well, when we started doing that, um, we were flowing and flowing slowly. We slowed down <laughs> and stopped. And it's like, this is not good, <laughs> right? And so we come to find out basically all the systems on the ground support equipment, again, this is ground support equipment, came from JPL with the spacecraft, special ground support equipment. We found that if the filter 
the return filter got all clogged up. I said, well, how the heck did this happen? Mm. We found out that the launch pad systems had some contamination. Mm -hmm. And luckily that filter caught the contamination, okay? So basically that's something that could have got in the spacecraft that we caught. And so we cleaned the filter, we flowed more, we did the test, pristine samples, we connected up, and then of course uh, serviced the orbiter. And so that's kind of what all this talks about. And kind of the sampling, again, probably a lot of people understand this, but the way you sample is you, you bring a person out there with a bottle or two or three, and you take samples right there at the interface just before the spacecraft. So you've got the very closest to the spacecraft to understand right there at that point where it enters the spacecraft, this is the sample you're taking. That's where you want to take it. Two, three times. Well, we were kind of under the gun at the time. This poor gentleman, <laughs> he took three samples, went off to do the sample test. Okay. Well, so it takes time to do this because you got to you know, take the samples and there's the process you do that. Well, everybody kept getting nervous. Why is it taking this guy so long? Hey, relax. It takes time to analyze a sample. All of a sudden, I don't know how they got his phone number. All these people are calling him. And the guy finally, hey, I talked to him later, he says, I pulled the phone off the hook. He says, I was getting so many calls, I went on to be done, I couldn't do my work. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, the, but the, the bottom line is, is that's the kind of critical thing we have to do before you know, we come um, connecting this stuff up. Anyways, the samples came back good, we connected up and we were good to go to the mission. So that was one of the, one of the aspects. Um, special gas. Um, Galileo had a series of instruments on that required very, very dry gaseous nitrogen. If it, moisture hit those instruments, again, you might as well bury the spacecraft in the sand. Well, of course, the spec for this one was negative 65 degrees dew point, which is very, very dry. dry. And so to pull that off, there's pad systems and then there's drag on systems we can use. Well, the pad systems feed up, as you see kind of in the oh, the pad system had these gas, basically bottles underneath it, then fed up into the MLP, into the shuttle, up through all the structure to feed via the shuttle. Well, if you want to have drag on, we would come in from where well, we put we put a tanker here of giant nitrogen, and there was a special line that was installed on the outside here that then fed into this room, what we call the payload change room, that went directly into the spacecraft. So you're not going through the shuttle, you're going directly into the spacecraft. And that was called a three-way valve. So basically you could come in, from outside coming from the shuttle, you can turn it off. Well, of course, when we had a drag on, we had this drag on, um, we were supplying directly to the spacecraft. Well, there's a, went up to a panel, the panel went to a special piece of GSC that JPL had to keep this stuff very dry. Um, and so it was, again, to maintain this was 24 7. If we, if we put, you know, damp, junk, damp GN2 in there, this right off the mission. And so this is kind of, I just want to show kind of a configuration we had to set up to keep this special purge going on these instruments to make sure that they didn't get damaged. Um, all this was going good, and you see the bottom <laughs> bullet there, this work was <laughs> working very well until Hurricane Hugo appeared and was heading right to Florida. So what do we do? <laughs> right? Okay, here's a good picture of Hugo. Um, initially, what we do, we always had a hurricane plan. For every payload we flew, we had a hurricane plan. What happens? If there's a hurricane, what do you do? And these are the you know, steps you follow. For Galileo, the initial idea was to pull it back out of the shuttle and send it back to the VPF mm -hmm. and kind of honker down there. Well, again, because of the planetary alignment now, we were kind of one of the just let's just leave it in the orbiter. Okay, what does that mean? Well, now you got to figure out some way why it's still in the orbiter to maintain this purge on these science experiments, right? And says, so okay, well, what do we do now? Well, bottom line, the MLP, and what I wanted to show here is, of course, here can you, this is the MLP, and if it zoomed in on one of the doors, that was basically built like a battleship. I mean, you go inside, that thing was, was stout, a really stout piece of structure. Well, the idea was, well, what if we set up a special room in there? You drag in all these K-bottles for the supply for the GN2, you bring in the ground support equipment, then you supply comm, food, water, and have somebody basically sit in the MLP and ride it out for seven days and be sure that this purge is going to be continuous. And that was one of my jobs. Was I was in the pit to do that. And this ended up being one of the longest days. It was 22 hours to try to set that up. The idea was we wanted these, um, there was requirements on the shuttle that the winds, once a hurricane was approaching, the winds could only be so high. You cannot roll back the winds above an X number. 
So we had to grow back before we hit that number. Okay, um, and so basically this room was all set up, was ready to go, and yeah, they had portable and facility comp. So we had comp, we had the OS boxes, but what if the electricity was down? What if the power was down? You got the mechanical, right? You got the TNT bottles with the GSA feeding the lines <coughs> to the panel. That's mechanical. That's easy. That's not going to fail because of power. But your electronics, you know, your lighting, you know, your communication, all that goes down. And electricity goes down. So we had portable ones. If that goes down, so you could communicate, hey, I'm still alive in here, <laughs> and stuff. And so that was the plan. That was to, to basically ride out Hurricane Hugo in the MLP to make sure the science equipment. And that was basically my job. Um, and then the second, just before Galileo was scheduled to leave the pad, basically we were within, I think, days of pulling the, pulling the plugs, Hugo turned north. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, and so we didn't have to basically roll back. And then uh, that's just basically some of the information about the storm. So that was another one of those operations you don't really hear about, but it was interesting because me and a McDonnell Douglas engineer were the two, one of the two. Well, he was married, he had children, I was still single at the time. I said, so you go spend the time with your family. I'm a single guy. And, you know, I got nobody at home. I'll just I'll ride this out. And luckily, it never had to happen. But it was a plan <laughs> to do that. Okay. Now RTGs. Let's get into the, kind of what the RTGs were. Um, this was kind of a power source. And again, why do you use these, especially for planetaries and going beyond the sun? Solar panels won't work. Won't provide the power. So you have an RTG to provide the power. Basically, what it is is plutonium. The heat from that is then transferred to, to create electricity from the decay of the plant cell. And it was 238. And this is basically just the chart from Scott that suggested it, showing the different type of RTDs and, and the vehicles that they were on. And I got this highlighted here. This is the one that we used for Galileo and Ulysses. That type of RTD was also used for Cassini and New Horizons mission. Which is suggest. But you can see. You know, all these, all these flights, and I guess still a lot of Mars stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. the biggest one, huh? 300 watts. Yeah. See the others? 110. Yeah. So you can see that. And then I've had a little note here in Voyager, it's 46 years <coughs> plus it's still providing power. Amazing. So and the reason for an RTG is uh, when you're going out to Jupiter, uh, solar rays aren't efficient enough. You're too far from the sun, and so you have to rely on the RTG to provide it. And they're very safe. The, the plutonium is well protected. You know, we did all kinds of analysis was done. What would happen if the orbiter broke up? And what if this re-entered? And uh, it would stay intact. It would not break apart. But even knowing that, uh, there's great care that goes into launching an, an RTG, on, whether it's on an expendable rocket, a human rocket, it doesn't matter. Uh, it involves uh, authorization from the president, uh, you know, the state of Florida is involved. There's a whole process that has to be gone through in order to ensure that it's safe to launch. And then should anything happen, all the contingency plans, should there be uh, any of that. So anybody that's worried about launching RTGs should not worry about it. It is uh, extremely well done and they're very reliable and safe. Yeah, in fact, that's basically, you know, basically the, and that's what we'll get to in these couple charts exactly what we're talking about, Bob. This is kind of what the guts of one looks like, uh, with the different radiation source, the cooling fans, again, the uh, cooling line feeds, and so. That's basically, and that's, the general purpose one was the one we used for this and the anti emissions. Okay. Um, the concerns, again, kind of things we talked about, um, you know, safety, heat source, um, launch, launch accident, you talked about fire, um, you talked about projectiles. Okay, something explodes, well maybe an explosion doesn't take out, but like a projectile may. Well that put to penetrate the RTG. Um, I also want to add, there is absolutely no concern of any kind of nuclear reaction. The only concern that you have on an RTG, should it break apart, is the radiation that would come from the plutonium. But yeah. there's, you know, it, people think about nuclear bombs and all that stuff, mm -hmm. not even close. Yeah, I remember when I was driving, because, you know, we had, well, we'll get in a little bit here about how they, uh, we had the protests and all that. But again, like you're saying, you know, it's not, an, it's not a nuclear bomb that's going to go off. If something happens to this, it's basically just you get the, the particles of, of plutonium that then would maybe disperse in the air. Um, and so, um, and again, it kind of, kind of, I don't know if we don't get into all this, but basically the way they did is they can case the plutonium in a case that then went inside the RTG. And again, stuff is bulletproof. I mean, you, 
all these all these scenarios Bob talked about, they tested and they tested and they tested, and this thing's not going to come apart. And like Bob says, you're not going to have a nuclear explosion. I remember where they had uh, one of the ladies that was at the, at the gate because we did have. Let me see. I think we've got the next. RTG concerns. Okay, we'll go here. Um, late 80s, nuclear was a dirty word, yeah. and because um, with the military superpowers, uh, Department of Defense, and blah blah blah. But then. Um, that was also many. They talked about allegations, you know, playing ecological roulette with the people of Florida. And the reason they said this was because remember the Soviet vehicle that crashed in what, Canada, the Cosmos ninety five vehicle. Um, it had nuclear fuel on it. Of course, people thought this is the same thing's going to happen with, with the RTGs. Um, and of course, our, our buddy Carl Sagan and Mark Taylor. There's nothing absurd about either side of the arc. Okay, there's two stories, but. Everybody, you know, whatever your opinion is, just your opinion, that's fine. Um, they had peace marches were undertaken, death scenes were enacted. Um, I remember coming in the gate, <laughs> and there's people standing at the gate with signs. Yeah. Parts in, in, but, but it was kind of controlled. It wasn't like, you know, we asked them, well, what if somebody steps on the road? Do we run them over? You know, like, and how does that work? <laughs> and of course, they said, no, no, don't run them over, you know, just stop. <laughs> but they had an agreement that the people would say, well, we will not interfere with people entering and leaving the space. So we understand it wasn't their decision, their job is just to make this thing fly. So we're not going to really try to mess with the people by stopping them from entering the space. But they were at the gates. Yes, Scotty. Mikey, you remember the favorite sign we saw? And whether the person had a good sense of humor or was legitimately just confused, he had a sign for Ulysses. Keep our son nuclear free. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want any nukes on the sun. Well, and the same, yeah, the same thing with Galileo. There was a there was a person. She's outside the gate, and she had a poster that had a nuclear, basically a, a nuclear bomb going off. Okay, that's what they thought would happen. About the same. And at the bottom, it said, "Please keep Ju Jupiter radiation free." <laughs> and again, you know, it's just if these people understood. What it was like, you know, we had to we had to protect the spacecraft from Jupiter, not Jupiter from the spacecraft. <laughs> and if they just would understand, you know, this, is, you know, so it was an, it was really interesting. So it was an interesting time, in that, um, um, you know, we had this going on. And again, the, the seconds at the bottom, six weeks to launch, timing was tight. We had to push security at the gate. Guards were armed with M16s and pistols. They talked about storming the launch site. <laughs> Um, three days before the scheduled launch, they, had, they were going to stage a mock death scene at the Cape, threaten to sit on Pad B, prevent, you know, Lance from launching. So all these things that were going on, and we just kind of dealt with it. I mean, that's just the way it was. And, yeah, Joel. Can I add a little bit more? Maybe sure. Again, as a Galileo assembly guy, if, if people, you know, you see diagrams and whatnot, but the, the RTG was a formidable thing, about a foot in diameter and about as high as the table. But, um, and it would, you know, without these fins off, them. But, but in sitting there in still air, and when we would bring them in and, and then attach them to the spacecraft, we did some tests back at JPL with that. Um, and then there's, there were the la almost the very last things installed uh, to the spacecraft at the pad, because you wanted basically everything else done except for, you know, fueling of the orbiter. Um, with it, without having to deal with these people and the protocols and the badging and the security and the, you know, we had to have top secret, we had to have secret clearance, secret clearance to work on the spacecraft because of the probability of working around there. So for a while I had secret clearance just for that. But if you put an RTG up in this room, you, everybody could feel it. It would be like walking in with a, with a roaring fireplace or a roaring fire. Mm -hmm. It was radiating, it, it was black, but it was radiating enough energy, you could feel it on your face when you walked into a room. Um, uh, pretty, pretty impressive thing. Yeah, so, yeah, so you know, yeah, and one of the things we'll talk about, some of the RTG operations, again, this is one of the things that I was assigned to was, uh, for Galileo, as a backup, if everybody knows Ray Lugo out there, he was actually the prime, I was his backup for Galileo, and then the prime on, on Ulysses. But um, again, due to the, like you were saying, due to the nature of these units, had to be installed spacecraft, you know, at the launch in the orbit at the launch pad late in the operation. Um, they had special platforms that were built, and of course, you need to test those platforms, um, you know, to make sure that they were going to be what you did. You did um, actual exercises took place. We had kind of what we do is we'd have a fake RTG, and we'd take it on exactly what we planned to do with the flight one. 
and haze. Okay, well, it's not going to fit in the elevator. It does fit in the elevator, but it doesn't roll well on the grading. Or, you know, and then, okay, once you got it in place, the platform's not close enough. You need to move the platform closer. Okay, well, now it's close enough, but you can't get to the hardware to, you know, you're not close enough to the bolts to bolt it in. And so we had these dry runs with fake RTGs to make sure all those procedures were prime and all the problems were worked out before the flight went in. Because you want to put the flight one in and go. You don't want to run into problems. And so we did a number of these simulations uh, with the RTGs um, before we before we flew. And again, we found a few bugs here and there, but, but overall, um, um, it went very well. And then the third bullet was we yeah, we transported them to the pad, installed for flight. And like you, Joe was saying, we had to wear dosimeters. Unfortunately, at the time, the dosimeters were kind of archaic, and so it it didn't have an automatic readout. Okay, so you wore the seminar and then two weeks later you turned it in. Well, because we got radiated, you know, you don't know for two weeks, right? It's not an instant readout. But we had we had control. We said, okay, you can be within this this distance of the RTG for this amount of time. And so we had all that. So I think we did. Yeah. I got a story about the seminar. Sure. So being an astronaut is actually a, a radiation hazard. It's monitored by yeah. OSHA, and uh, because of the space environment. And uh, so we launched with those seminars in our launch and entry suit, and we're supposed to wear them the whole time we were in space to keep track of how much radiation you have had, because mm. it limit you're limited on the number of flights. The so long duration flights, obviously, a lot more, but uh, at some point you reach your limit and you can't fly in space anymore. Right. And uh, as far as I can remember, on all four of my missions, my uh, dosimeter never left my launch and entry suit, and it was probably in some place in the orbiter where it was pretty well shielded. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't do that, did you, Bob? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bob. It's a, this is how I, I know that I'm going to go to Mars. <laughs> because, uh, Everybody's going to get cancer eventually anyway, and I'm old enough that it doesn't matter, and I'm still healthy enough that I can go. <laughs> One thing, too, I'll talk about health. I don't know if you heard about when I will tell a story about the ML, the new ML for Artemis. <laughs> the elevators, when I was right? Director. Yeah, when you're center yeah. director, the elevators weren't working. Yet. No, yeah. they they were working. It was just it was a challenge. Oh, a challenge. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell, tell a story. <laughs> From the zero deck. Yeah. From the zero deck to the top of the ML, and uh, well, how how high was that? I don't know. It was <laughs> 400 and some feet. Yeah. Okay, 400 and some feet. So I I had the record, uh, like five minutes and 20 seconds or something. Oh, uh, Running the stairs. I, I ran most of the way, then I slowed down a little bit. When I finally got to the top, I just laid on my back and sucked oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, I was in my, I guess I was in my mid-60s. Yeah. At the time. Yeah, he set the record. And, for, and uh, yeah. nobody, I had the record, and then some 20-something National Guard guy beat me. <laughs> <laughs> but he's the only one that beats That's amazing. I still tell that story. Uh, you, you were a record holder. My name and my time are on the back of the door at the top of the ML. <laughs> awesome. That's the Artemis. That's what's flying Artemis. That's what's launching the Artemis. Um, awesome. Um, let's see what we did. Okay, yeah, this is basically. Uh, yeah, the operations, and then um, we did the exercise, and it turned out awesome. I mean, the RTGs went on fine, um, transported the pad, a very successful operation. Test was completed, we were ready to go for launch. Um, and then in September, of course, like Bob was saying, we had to get the president approval. Every time we launch one of these, you have to have a president approval, which he did. Um, the launch was delayed by some faulty engine controllers, um, and eventually we uh, postponed until the 17th. Now again, because of, we launched on the 18th, um, because of the window we had in the 21st of November. So we had almost a month gap there where we, if something went wrong, we could still launch because the window ran out November 21st. If we tried to launch past November 21st, we'd have to wait 13 months. Okay. So again, it was, again, it was, um, it was a very interesting mission. It took a lot of, to, for, as far as the ground processing thing, we to work, and of course the interesting stuff would work. But we launched. Okay, this is some really cool pictures. This is a deploy showing again the IUS vehicle with this Ulysses uh, spacecraft on top of it, and this is the structure that held it in the shuttle. And again, be horizontal for launch. We launch, the doors would open, it would rotate the vertical, and then deploy. I mean, this is the back shot of that vehicle um, as it's basically after it was deployed and headed towards Jupiter. Okay. Now, because it wasn't headed toward Jupiter. No, not, 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 not no. Jupiter, you're right. It was actually headed <laughs> away from Jupiter. It was actually fired away from Jupiter. That was, and that's the next thing. Because the IUS was lower power, 
you had to do a number of gravity assists mm -hmm. from planets to be able to get you there. Mm. You know, um, the centaur could go whoop. With IUS, you had to whoop, to get enough energy to go to Jupiter. Okay? And that's kind of what this is. I don't know if anybody can read this, but it's basically the orbital projector to get this thing to, to the Jupiter. And, and the folks at JPL, they, they have the best uh, folks at orbital mechanics ever. When it, they are amazing at how they figure out how to use planetary assist to get payloads where they need to go. It, it's absolutely awesome. Yeah. And then we can describe exactly how that works. Um, you have here where you launch. Okay. Now, again, for Galileo, we're supposed to go to Jupiter, but what we did is we actually launched towards the sun. We needed, to, we needed assist from Venus. So you go by Venus, and we launch in October. We get the Venus flyby in uh, February 10th, of 1990. We get back around, another flyby Earth. Okay. So. And what we did is actually I looked up the data. We got about 11,000 miles per hour from Venus, about 8,900 miles per hour extra from the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from from that, yeah. And one thing too about the way that you kind of think about how does this actually work? Okay. Well, you got the gravity's pulling the spacecraft. I mean, the planet's pulling the spacecraft towards, you know, the planet's pulling the spacecraft. Yeah, towards the planet. Well, it's pulling it, it speeds it up. Well, as it went by, why well, doesn't that same gravity? slow it down to the same speed that it left at, right? It's going to speed it up. Why doesn't it slow down? Well, the planet's moving in the same direction as the vehicle. And that's what gives you that little extra kick because you're moving in the same direction. It keeps that little extra boost because you're both proceeding. It. And so that was used basically to gain velocity. And so we basically went by the Earth the first time, about 600 miles. Then we went out, basically flew by an asteroid, then back to Earth, <laughs> okay? So second Earth flyby. This one was the one everybody was worried about. This came within 188 miles of the surface. It was an orbit of 180 miles of the wind came in. So it was real close. People right. were freaking out. Um, but then what's that got the last kick to send that on the Jupiter. Yeah. And so you had to do a Venus flyby, single two Earth flybys to get it to, uh, to Jupiter. And then basically it arrived in 95. And we won't go over everything that happened, at the, at the, but then the mission actually ended in 97. And kind of the way it ended was it was starting to lose propellant and, and control. And they did not want this thing just crashing into anything it wanted to crash into. So before they lost command and control of the vehicle, they actually um, aimed it into the planet Jupiter. They aimed it into the, into the atmosphere so it would burn up, basically, in, in the planet Jupiter. So that's what happened in 97, 97, 97. This is just a picture. This is kind of cool. A picture of Earth and Moon from Galileo as it flew by, mm -hmm. one of the flybys. And then this is kind of a picture out of it at Jupiter with the artist concept of the antenna not being fully deployed. Yeah. So that's basically Galileo. Okay. Now for Bob's man. Oh, one thing, one thing, yeah. Interesting. We had that, remember the comet Shoemaker Levy 9 that impacted Jupiter? Remember? We saw you very unique. Galileo, because of where it was, was on the far side of Jupiter. Okay. We were on the side of Jupiter that we couldn't see the actual impact. We saw the results of the impacts, but it was on the back side of Jupiter away from us. Well, Galileo was on the back side of Jupiter when that happened. And so these are pictures of the actual impacts that Galileo took. Just happened to be in the right spot when those impacts took place. And, mm -hmm. and so this is basically a sequence of four shots of, a, of it actually impacting. And again, at the time, they weren't really sure the exact timing, but they planned it out and they got these four shots. Uh, basically, the, the fragment W. This one's the, the, the fragment W. So this is kind of cool that they were able to pull it off because of Galileo. And then the end of Galileo, basically, yeah, they would do, they would run out of propellant. And so the last signals received on the 21st, 2003, at 3:43 Eastern Standard, and then it burned up. So it's gone. Okay. Now to Ulysses. Okay. Ulysses. That's Bob's mission. I get to talk. No, I, whatever you want to, yeah, <laughs> go for it. No, this so, is basically just so Ulysses was a, a joint NASA ESA project. Uh, the program manager was Derek Eaton. He was a Brit, and uh, we made one trip over to uh, Norvik in the Netherlands for briefings on it before it was shipped to the United States. Um, Ulysses, and we'll get to some pictures of its orbit and everything. Uh, it had 11 experiments on board to study the polar regions of the sun, which had never been done before. All the planets, of course, orbit the uh, sun 
in the ecliptic plane. And so uh, Ulysses went out to Jupiter, and it flew over the north pole of Jupiter, and then using a gravity assist from Jupiter, it was flung out of the ecliptic plane into a five-year orbit around uh, the sun. Now, why didn't it have to make moves like Galileo? In addition to the inertial upper stage, it also had a payload assist module on it so that it could go directly uh, to Jupiter. Uh, the closest Ulysses ever got to the sun was when it was launched uh, here on planet Earth, uh, where it was one astronomical unit away. Uh, once launched, it went into a five-year orbit around the sun. And uh, obviously, uh, Jupiter and then on the uh, perigee, the short side of the uh, orbit, it was, I think it was about one and a half AUs from the sun when it went around the uh, back side of the sun and back out to Jupiter. It was designed for one pass around the sun, one five-year mission, and it lasted for 18 years. And what's really cool, <clears throat> it got to, it went, when it went around the sun five years and then five years later, the sun's on about a 10-year solar cycle, okay? And it got to see the sun at both a solar minimum and a solar maximum. And so uh, not only did it uh, get to see the sun twice, it got to see it uh, three times uh, in those uh, 15 years, five years orbits. And uh, it was just great science that was done out of the uh, 11 experiments. Awesome. Yeah. And Bob was the pilot for that flight. I was. It was my first flight. Well, where, where were you at for the deployment? So, well, we'll, we'll, get well, we'll get into that, yeah. Well, you can talk about the ground process. Okay. <laughs> 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 History of Ulysses, uh, again, they talked about doing this kind of flight all the way back in 1959. Uh, how, did, how would you do that? And then basically the gravity assists, which were basically done by Pioneer 10 and 11, proved that, hey, we can use the gravity of these planets to pull this off. Um, Europe and NASA studied the possibility of an auto ecliptic, which is the OOE mission in the early 70s. Of course, that was changed to, to the Ulysses later. The mission was approved in 76. Um, the payload was approved in 77, and the launch was set up for February of 83. Um, by 1980, again, we're concentrated on the shuttle. This was before the shuttle flew. Financial cutbacks were made. ESA decided, however, to go ahead with their spacecraft with half their instruments on board from the United States. Again, renamed Ulysses to be launched in May of 86. Um, and of course, once we had Challenger in, in January of 86, um, uh, after it was shipped, the Challenger occurred and we had to go back out and uh, the spacecraft was dismantled and back to Europe. When the shuttles began were started in 89, Ulysses was given a new launch opportunity and was successfully launched on the 6th of October 1990. Okay. Again, this is some of the operations at Kennedy. Um, like Bob was saying, this is the Ulysses spacecraft. Kennedy is a lot smaller than Galileo. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the PAM that was mounted to with the IUS underneath. This is done again at the VPF, vertical installation, vertical processing. This is a good shot of the whole stack. The, the IUS, the PAM, and then you see a little space <laughs> at the top. Okay, and that's again in the VPF. Once we got into the orbiter, um, the RTG was installed again. Same thing as in Galileo. We did a number of dry runs of how do we transport this, how do we install it, secure it, how do we cool it, how do we test it. All that was done um, to prove that when we got the flight RTG there, that all we would go, it went smooth. This is basically a picture of it in the orbiter, vertically at the pad, looking down uh, with the RTG. This is the RTG that's installed. Now, one of the things was, and I was talking about, was because it's got a big extra kick, you see the RTG's hanging way off on the end. Mm -hmm. Of course, what that does gives you a big moment on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you put a lot of energy into that, they, were, they actually saw that the RTG would probably break off. Mm -hmm. So there's a structure, you'll see in another photograph under here, that's mm -hmm. supporting the RTG. Okay, so all was good. We did basically spacecraft together, st the stack, and into the orbiter. And off we go, we're ready to go. So uh, launch. Um, 1990 was the summer of the hydrogen leak on the orbiter. Mm -hmm. And they could not solve the problem. It, it was taken forever, and they finally fixed it. Uh, STS-41 being a planetary uh, mission, we had a window that we had to make. And it really helped me because we jumped over five flights in front of us. <laughs> Instead of being the 41st space shuttle mission, we were the 36th shuttle mission. We, we went ahead of uh, a whole bunch of other missions and uh, it, it worked out well. 
when we uh, were in the launch count, um, we sat for a long time. We had a we had a huge launch window on the day of the launch. It's not like uh, today where the orbiter had a five minute window for uh, going to the International Space Station on that rendezvous. We were with SpaceX now when we launch crew, it's an instantaneous launch window to get the absolute best performance uh, to make it up to ISS. We were there for a couple hours and we were in, in a hold. There were rain showers and stuff in, in the area. And eventually it's clear and we're counting down. And uh, we got down to 31 seconds and we went into a hold. Oh. And uh, we're holding, I, you know, I'd started the APUs. We were good to go. We're gonna launch. Nope, we're holding at 31 seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike talked about uh, keeping dry nitrogen on Galileo. Well, the Pale of Bay had a nitrogen purge in order to keep the environment right for the, uh, for the spacecraft. And the nitrogen purge had failed. And so we're holding it 31 seconds. And I, I can hear all the conversations on the loop. And uh, Bob Seek was our, our launch director. I think he's up. He's up here. Here. Yeah. Bob Seek, Bob, is Bob still here? Yeah, he left. But anyway, so um, there's all this discussion on the loops about not having this nitrogen purge. And finally, Bob Seek uh, speaks up and he says, just remember, in 31 seconds, there isn't going to be a nitrogen purge anymore. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, uh, the engineering team said, yeah, yeah we're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, but you know, having, I'm telling you, when you come out of 31 second hole and you're launching, you, <laughs> that's quick. <laughs> so uh, we launched, uh, we were also a first day deploy. And there was always concerns, you know, we've learned a lot about flying humans in space and what it takes to adapt and what you can do and stuff. And uh, space motion sickness, uh, SAS, space adaptation syndrome. And there's absolutely no correlation between air sickness and space sickness. I, I know pilots that uh, don't get air sick, that get space sick. I know people that fly on airplanes that get air sick and on boats, and they don't get uh, sick in space, okay? So you, it's kind of hard to predict. Well, what we haven't learned is that within 24 to 48 hours, everybody gets over it and, and you adapt. And we've also found that there are drugs that will help you adapt if necessary to prevent, you know, the nausea. Uh, so our commander, Dick Richards, and it, we were a really junior crew. Uh, Dick had flown once as a pilot, now he's flying as a commander. Bill Shepard had flown once as a mission specialist, now he's flying as MS-2 as our flight engineer. Uh, it's my first flight as a pilot, Tom Aker's first flight as an MS, uh, Bruce Melnick's first flight as an MS, so really junior. Uh, and it, that's another thing, it was a really short mission. This is back when they launched you, you deployed your satellite, did a little uh, science, and, and came home. And we only, it was only a five day mission, uh, which, geez, all that work to get up there. <laughs> and we're coming right back because they got other missions they want to launch. So, uh, we're on orbit, and uh, Dick, we ground tested all these drugs. And because we've got a first day to apply, some of the drugs make you a little sleepy, where you're, you're not quite yourself. So Dick said, it doesn't matter how sick anyone is, we're not taking, you're not allowed to take any drugs until after we get this deployed done and we're going to bed at night, you know, and make sure everything's right. First thing you do when you get on orbit is you gotta open up the payload bay doors. If you don't get the payload bay doors open, you're coming home, because that's the cooling uh, for the vehicle on orbit. Um, and on a first day deploy, uh, it, it comes really fast. You got a lot going on. You know, you launch, you get through uh, setting up on orbit, get all the computers, everything in place, and then you go right into uh, setting up to deploy the spacecraft. And uh, Dick, uh, our commander, Dick Richards, was acting as overall supervision. I was in the commander's seat. I maneuvered the orbiter to uh, the deploy attitude. Uh, Tom Akers was in charge of uh, all the deployment, and he's going through all the switches on the panel right behind the uh, CDR on the aft flight deck. And you saw those really nice pictures of uh, Galileo, and we got no nice pictures of Ulysses in the Pale of Bay uh, prior to the play or whatever. It was just, it was a busy time, and if I had my crew movie here, you could see a video of it. You know, we took really nice film of uh, the Ulysses deploy. But uh, it all went uh, flawlessly, and uh, it got ejected out of the uh, payload bay, and then we maneuvered to get away from it because we didn't want to be near it when the uh, IUS uh, lit, just in case uh, something were to go wrong. So I got to do that maneuver too. 
and then uh, it ignited straight out to Jupiter and had an absolutely 18-year successful mission. Beautiful. Yeah, a couple, just real quick one to elaborate on the deploy. You show the deploy coming up and the IUS fire here. One thing he, he talked about, Bob talked about was on top of the IUS was this PAM, this PAM D. So basically he separated and the PAM would then, what happens with the PAM is um, to, to stabilize the spacecraft in PAM, the PAM actually, you deploy from IUS, the PAM actually had a system on it that spun it up about 70 RPMs. But then when it lit, it kind of kind of gives you a, kind of a way of, of staying on track. Okay, so the PAM fires, it's going about 70 RPMs. Okay, PAM stopped, well, 70 RPMs is way too fast for the spacecraft for its mission. So what it did, it was a very ingenious system was they had counterweights on the PAM that then would deploy out like a, like a speed skater or a mm. ice skater. You know, they're in to spin fast, they open their arms to slow down a lot. So they, they sent these weights out, the exact weight, the exact length to slow the RPMs down to 8 RPMs. Amazing. That's and then basically the, the spacecraft separated. So all these things that had to happen before the spacecraft was really on its way. That was this what I want to kind of show here was the spin up and then spin down. And then very finally the separation and the design toy. So that gave it the energy to go to Jupiter. That really works too. I got down on a mid deck and I got real tight like this and had somebody spin me as fast as I could. I put my arms and legs up and go real slow and then you tuck in and you're spinning real fast. It really works. And then uh, this is what you talked about. What is the orbit? Basically went out to uh, went out to um, an elliptical orbit and went through basically ignored it. Actually, this is what it went to uh, Jupiter and then it was deployed into the actually three, three orbits of, of the sun. This is just orbit one. This is, the, this is the first one. Each orbit took five years. So it had three full orbits of the sun uh, before it uh, failed. Okay. Let's just give you a profile of what that orbit looks like. Again, it was looking at the sun, but it wasn't anywhere near the sun. Yeah. Very successful flight. I and mean, this is kind of the orientation where it took the sciences. And this basically this yellow area was uh, the poles of the sun to get the, uh, the data that they wanted. 34 years ago, I could have told you what those 11 experiments were. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to have to believe me, there were 11 experiments. <laughs> one of them was studying the magnetosphere of the sun. But, uh, yeah. And again, one little night is that was actually at the time was the fastest spacecraft ever, 34,000 miles an hour. The New Horizons is the only one that got faster than it. Again, because you had the IUS and the PAM and a small spacecraft. It really gave it a good kick. So that's basically what, and there's three of these kind of orbits that took place before basically it died. And then this is the, uh, like Bob was saying, after 18, over 18 years, um, the, it was basically, it was started, you know, there's, they needed, to, they needed to shut it down. And so at the times they sent the last command, it was about four, 5.4 astronomical units from the Earth, basically was way out there with a one time signal about 45 minutes. But it was shut down at, uh, on the 30th of June, 2009. Yeah. So it's it still orbiting the sun? It's still yeah. out there. But it's, yeah. it's, it's just dead, yeah. Unlike Galileo, it doesn't exist. It's still out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Space jump. Yeah. And I think that was it. All right. Yeah, that was the last one. So we got 15 minutes for questions. Yep, 15 minutes for questions. Super. Have to be on any of this, anything and everything. Well, I have a question about Ulysses on the, on the science side. I'm, probably just, I'm showing my ignorance here, but why do you know why it had to be so far away from the sun? Why couldn't we do the same science from one AU hmm. outside because the atmosphere? But. You got to get to the polar regions of the sun. It, you know, we know what the sun looks like on its equatorial. We've had a lot of study of the sun around the equator, looking at it from Earth, and you know deployed uh, telescopes and stuff, but we've never been able to see the sun from its polar regions. Why and, so far? Why so far? Well, because Jupiter, it had to get to Jupiter mm -hmm. to be a big enough planet to give it the gravity assist to get it out of the ecliptic plane. Uh, okay. yeah. 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 That was the closest we could make do. the turn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what did we actually learn about it going over the poles? Uh, that I'll have to get one of the scientists. I, I'll, I'll get your paper. You can Google it. But like I said, we learned about 
we, we learned how the sun works. We learned a lot more about the sun than we already knew. And it, it's kind of important to know about the sun. You know, because if we don't have it, it's not very good. Wow. And it's going to end one day. It's not our problem, but it's going to be something else. But, you know, it's just increasing our knowledge of uh, our universe that we live in and how it all works. Okay, the lady and then a the gentleman. Yeah, um, anybody can answer the question on the panel. It doesn't matter who answers it. Um, what kind of involvement for Ulysses did you all have with, I know it's a joint NASA ESA project, what kind of like working relationship did you have with ESA to uh, put that you hmm. know, spacecraft out, basically? Yeah, I mean, we work extremely well with ESA, and it was a, it was a partnership. We had uh, experiments that the U.S. built and designed on the spacecraft as well as but it was the Europeans that built it. The part of the agreement was, we'll build the spacecraft, you guys launch it. And that's kind of the way these things work a lot. But there's also an exchange of experiments also. But, no, I mean, um, we work extremely well with our partners. And it, it just look at the International Space Station. You know, you got ESA and all its partner uh, countries, the United States, Japan, uh, Canada, Russia, and we're all working together as one. It, it's, I think, this is how we should explore space as a cooperative effort. Yeah, my part of it was the person that actually installed the RTG was European. They were responsible for their spacecraft. And so the platform we created for them, and basically we created a platform you could stand in. And again, the idea was you didn't spend as, as much, tried to limit the time near the RTG, we know, you know, the protection. And so we had a platform, and we actually had a little, little almost like a, a stand that the tools would sit on. So we had all those tools right there. He had to stand, he can go in and have all the tools to do the job and get out. And he was a European. And of course the communication, you know, you knew English, which is great. Um, that was one of the things that we learned right off was, you know, everybody comes in from different countries, okay? And it's, instead of us trying to learn six or seven different languages, then basically they would learn English, which is a big help to us. And so a lot of times we, we spoke English. And so, Working directly with them was amazing because he was just, he was a gentleman that had to go in there and do the RTG work and he, he says, I would like to have this, okay, so we do that, okay, does that make sense? Yeah, that's. And so basically the, the bottom line was whatever he asked us to do, we did and he was very cordial. He says, okay, that's just what I need. It was, it was just, it was like working with anybody else. Mm -hmm. And again, we used, to, we used to call it throwing your badge on the table. It didn't matter what badge you had on, we just got the job done. The gentleman back there. On the RTGTs, um, you mentioned the gentleman mentioned the size of the actual container, but how much actual physical material were you guys using? Do you have any idea how much that was in there? Um, it had the actual weight. Oh, I missed that. I'm sorry. Yeah, on this chart, it's okay. Yeah, it has the actual uh, mass. We used again. We used the ones we have here, so yeah. about 55, 56. For the mass, total mass. That's yeah. total mass. Yeah. yeah. It's not the mass of all the That's not the mass of plutonium. Oh, 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 okay. It has the structure of the fuel. So. Well, if I can throw another one at Bob. Um, what's the thing that surprised you most about space work? Hmm. About space flight? Yeah. Uh, probably the ride uphill. Uh, <laughs> there's not, no simulator prepares you for that. It's better than a cat shot off an aircraft carrier. It just gets up and goes. Mm. And uh, I was surprised at uh, how rough it was on the solids and then how smooth it was on the uh, main engines. Um, it, that was probably the, the only thing that you know you couldn't simulate. And I think the best part about space flight was looking down on the Earth from, you know, on Ulysses we were 160 nautical miles circular. Uh, you know, on my ISS mission, we were about 250 <coughs> nautical miles. And uh, just looking down on the Earth from that distance, it, it's just a beautiful blue jewel of a planet. It is absolutely amazing. Anytime I had any spare time at all, I was looking out the window at the Earth. Thank you. Young man. So you said that the RTG could survive uh, entry. Yep. Uh, what were the protections of the plutonium? You know, I don't know how it was encased. Uh, but it was in a, it, it was encased such that, you know, it was well protected. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I had no concerns about it being on the orbit with me. They might be. Call up your next slide if they could show Yeah, they, they talked about the, uh, there you go. well, it, it kind of like, yeah, it's a basically. Oh, it shows it as a red one. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a, like a silicon kind of, yeah. ceramic kind of support. It was actually in a, in a capsule. The yeah. It was in a capsule that was internal. The heat source is really the encapsulation. Like a puck, like a puck. Is that right? Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, question for Louis. Uh, during that 300 second long propellant dump you're talking mm -hmm. about, would that have occurred during powered flight or during gliding flight? It was right away, as soon as you were supposed to start venting hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other side of the shuttle. Uh, yeah, we never really uh, got into the shuttle, you know, to try that. Uh, it was the way to test it. So, so you had to be at least 300 yeah. seconds away from land. That was the, the number I recall, 300 seconds to empty the whole thing out. Yeah. But, you know, when, you, when you're inside a cargo bay also, something yeah. I thought about later, we have a hazardous gas detection system that's looking for hydrogen or any anything that's leaked. So in the um, cargo bay, like Dan Johnson said, we're able to keep it a lot tighter than even the shuttle was was able to. You know, in the aft compartment, you have more hazardous gas that we had ended up with the center, shuttle center. So it was it was tight. Yeah, one of the things that uh, Steve was tell, talking about was the weight. You know, the weight of why we have to dump it. Because of the mm -hmm. weight of this, you couldn't even launch, but you couldn't land. And so they landed with this thing fueled, basically would have come through the bottom of the orbit. Or the Plus the slosh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the slosh when you do an RTLS or something. Slush, you know. yeah. so. But again, this was, this was an abort scenario. So you, right. But right. I don't think they could have done anything until the, the, the SRVs you couldn't do anything until the solids are burned yeah. off, and yeah. probably not until the mains are yeah. burned off. Yeah. Yeah. But you're trying to you're trying to lighten the weight for landing, so there was there would be a few minutes there, even if you're trying to land in Africa. Or, yeah. Then all these valves had to work and all that. So yeah, it was very complex. If you had to do an abort and come back home, it was very complex. <coughs> like you said, after the uh, SRBs were gone. Yeah, so that's uh, that's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah. Mark. Uh, I think I speak for everybody. We're happy to see Mr. Cabana back on the Space Coast and uh, enjoy your retirement. Uh, like Nick pointed out there, you're talking about the rookie crew of 41 or no. and so forth. So I'm not going to pretend I remember which one was your fourth and last <laughs> mission. But uh, what was the difference? Were you kind of cocky on that fourth mission? You knew what was going on, or did you still have the butterflies? So, so uh, what's really interesting is, you know, you're trained and you fly your first mission, and then you go through the training flow. I was the pilot again on Discovery for my second flight. It was a classified DD mission. Mm -hmm. And when you learn something on your training flow for your second mission that you hadn't learned before. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I don't think you never get cocky. Um, there's, uh, it, it's a serious business. And you want to be as best prepared as you possibly can. And uh, you know, I often get asked, were you scared? And what causes fear? Fear is a lack of knowledge about something. And we conquer fear through uh, studying, being well prepared. And I, I was never afraid. I knew that I was the best prepared for what I was doing. I was good at it. I had the best team on the ground supporting me. And God was going to take care of me and my family regardless of what happened. But uh, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's serious business. You are constantly paying attention and making sure that you're doing the best that you can and uh, as a commander that you're taking care of the crew as mm -hmm. best you can. As a pilot, my first flight, I never looked out the window on Ascent. You know, I was just, I had a job. I was responsible for all the systems. I, you know, the pilot gets all the hard systems. The commander's got it easy. He's got the life support. <laughs> <laughs> you got the main engines, the hydraulic system, the fuel uh, system, the reaction control get, jets, the orbital maneuvering system, all that stuff's on the pilot side. I was staring at the gauges and making sure all the systems that everything was going right. And it was my second and third flights that I started looking out the window. This was the last one. I don't think there's anything better in this business than getting to hear the history from the people who made it. Mm. And we want to take the opportunity to thank you all for your stories and thank you for your part in all this history. Thank you very much. I have one question for Bob. I have uh, one answer. Okay. <laughs> Out of all the tasks that you performed during your career, and that, I know there were many in that, could you please explain? The best what, ones? Yeah. The, the best skin? Working under Terry's supervision, putting uh, <laughs> putting the, the gap fillers in on the tiles of Discovery before oh, yeah. its final mission, and saying, God, I hope those things are still in there when it comes home. <laughs> and then, uh, the broom crew. Most of them don't understand so, the broom crew. Uh, I closed the uh, landing gear doors on the last flights of the orbiter, and basically, 
the doors don't close on their own. They get part way up, and, but they don't latch. And so essentially, you've got this uh, padded broom that you come up under and you push, and they latch into place. Four technicians push the doors closed. Yeah. So I got to do that. <laughs> he says, is there any way I can get on that job? And I said, yeah, you just have to be here when we're getting ready to close the doors, because we don't wait on anybody. But yeah. So he showed up and got to push the doors closed. Mark, we got some. And they opened. Yeah. Yes, and they opened. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thank you for uh, crashing our party.